Hi. I'm here today to release an ornithopter and describe some of the new quote-unquote technology behind it. This is the 07HF Firefly. Despite its simple appearance, it represents a fairly significant advancement in my ornithopter designs. We'll start with a quick tour, demonstration, and operations tutorial. Then, if you're interested, you can stick around and we'll get into the weeds on how this design works and what separates it from its predecessors mechanically. Now, operations. First, let's go over controls. The binds are listed in the seat, but I'm kind of inventing terms here, so it's probably best to explain what I'm up to. If any of you folks study birds or are better educated in aerospace than I am, by all means let me know the proper language for this stuff. Starting with the top right, we have frequency. This is your throttle, and it directly controls the rate at which the firefly's wings beat. The maximum value here is 3, which isn't in any particular units. If you're curious, some bar mass suggests that, at maximum throttle, the wings complete one stroke every 10.46 ticks, and thus beat at roughly 5.75 hertz. This is much faster than my previous ornithopters. We'll get into how and why later. For now, suffice to say that you'll usually fly between values of 2.5 and 3, maybe as low as 2 sometimes. Of note, the Firefly is the first of my ornithopters to be capable of comfortably taxiing under its own power without the use of motorized wheels, so lower end of the throttle is good for that. Moving on from frequency control, the second lever down on the right controls what I've been calling incidence bias. This is the most complicated control, so bear with me. You can think of this sort of like a hybrid between flaps and thrust vectoring, and it's key to this ornithopter's stall and slow flight performance, as well as, hopefully, the VTOL performance of its successors. A few of my ornithopters have had incidence bias controls in the past, but this is the first where it can really be safely and productively used without extremely careful flying and a little luck. As such, it's probably time I properly explain what it does. While the ornithopter is flapping, you've probably noticed that it angles its control surfaces up and down with the wing beats to produce net thrust. You can think of this like a propeller with blades that swing back and forth rather than around in circles. In aviation, the angle at which the wing meets the fuselage is called the angle of incidence. Since we're only using control surfaces, this is effectively what we're working with here. If you watch closely, you can see that, by default, the firefly's wings angle slightly further up than they do down. It's, that is to say, its incidence is biased toward the positive. Looking at the default lever value there, you can see that it is biased to the positive by 0.2, or 20% of the control surface's total travel. The higher this value, the more the control surfaces are offset. At the maximum value of 1, the control surfaces are completely flat on the downstroke, producing only lift, while they are angled up on the upstroke, producing primarily thrust. This configuration can produce perfectly vertical thrust if pushed out of phase with the wing beat at high frequencies, but this ornithopter doesn't attempt that as it doesn't have quite enough power to climb vertically with that stroke. Instead, we keep the forward thrust we get on the upstroke and wind up with a thrust vector theoretically pointed about 45 degrees down. In cruise flight, incidence bias can range from 0.1 to 0.6 or so. The slower you want a cruise nose level, the higher you want the incidence bias. You can get stable level flight as slow as 40 knots this way. You can also use values between 0.4 and 0.7 or so for short takeoff operations. I recommend a value of about 0.5. Higher values might get you off the ground at slightly less distance, but don't provide much climb performance once you are. Values over 0.8 should only be used during landing. Please note, you may notice adverse yaw, which is the tendency for an aircraft to yaw opposite the direction you're trying to roll it in, at high incidence bias values. This effect is much more mild and controllable here than it was on the Mariposa, but it helps to be aware of it. We'll get into why it happens and what I did to make it manageable in the nerd section. On the left side of the cockpit, we have a third lever. This controls what I'm calling blade angle. Real helpful, I know. Pretty much everything on the ornithopter could be said to control blade angle in one way or another. But what I mean here is, it is control over how steep or shallow the change in blade angle is over the course of the wing beat. You can think of this like a prop pitch control for a variable pitch propeller. In fact, it isn't even an allegory. They do exactly the same thing. Values here are in percent of total control surface travel. At maximum, 1.0, the blades use all of the angle they have available to them. This produces the highest static thrust, but also a good deal of drag. In level flight, a blade angle of 1.0 will fetch a roughly 70 knot cruise. Conversely, the minimum angle here is 0.6, or roughly 60% of the total blade travel. This low value produces very poor static thrust, but also has a much more favorable thrust curve. It retains thrust at much higher speeds than the default setting. A blade angle of 0.6 will fetch roughly a 90-knot cruise. 
The Firefly is quite tame at all blade angle settings, but in general you want to use high settings like the default during takeoff and landing, and low settings like 0.6 in cruise. It'll fly just fine at 1.0 all the time if you don't want to fiddle with it though. Note, all three of these lever axes are hotkeyed. The throttle is bound to the arrow key up and down, blade angle is bound to 1 and 2, and incidence to 3 and 4. The rest is self-explanatory. Fly it around and get a feel for it. You may find you want to tap the rudder, side arrow keys, when entering turns, particularly at high incidence bias. Now, performance figures. As for speed, I'm afraid I'm not quite so obsessed as to put together a properly researched V-speed table, but your best angle of climb should be right around 55 knots with a blade angle of 1.0. Takeoff and climb performance, with default incidence bias, should be good enough to clear the Creative Island Mountains while taking off from the hangar without turning. Maximum cruise is just under 90 knots, and minimum cruise is about 45, at high incidence bias. I recommend speeds around that lower end when attempting short landings. It is easiest to place the ornithopter in slow flight and then ease back on the throttle to the, to the desired descent rate. You should retain pitch control down to very slow speeds. Range. The Firefly is diesel electric by default, and features an automated diesel generator running on 176 liters refuelable from the port just behind the name on the left side. You can also externally charge it from the port under the left forward wing if you wish. The aircraft has a roughly 20 kilometer range on battery alone, which the diesel generator extends to about 120 kilometers. Aside from fuel, you can ignore the generator. It should take care of itself. Running whenever the battery drops below 95% and auto throttling to maintain 91 or so in flight. If the fuel is depleted, the generator will shut down. If you refuel it and the ornithopter still needs charging, it should start again automatically. Shake. You've probably noticed that shake is almost completely absent from this ornithopter. We'll discuss why in greater detail in the nerd section, but you may notice some transient shake when side-loading the wings, such as during hard yaw, flying knife edge, or rolling in and out of steep turns. This seems to occur randomly. My current theory is that it has to do with physics detail being artificially reduced due to the presence of multiple AI vehicles or something like that. Shot in the dark, though. If you experience shake like that, roll out and you should be fine. Of note, the shake comes from the supposed collision between wing hinges and the housing they reside in. If you can't stand their occasional occurrence, and most flights I don't get them at all, you can always gut the area around the wing hinges. Getting rid of the glass should eliminate it entirely. I like the look of the housing though, and the problem is rare enough that I'm not willing to sacrifice it. That's all for features and flying. I hope you enjoy the Firefly, and I hope it inspires you to work on weird stuff yourself. Stormworks is a surprisingly powerful engine, and there's a lot of fun to be had with it. Now, let's get on to the nerd stuff. Feel free to skip if you're not into this sort of thing, but I live for it. You've been warned. Alright, now that you've seen what the Firefly can do and how to operate it, let's get into what makes it so different. The headline here, of course, is the high wing beat frequency compared to earlier designs. For reference, the Mariposa's highest frequency setting delivered a wing beat frequency of just 2.14 Hz compared to the Firefly's nearly 6 Hz. Earlier designs have always been limited by one of two factors blade wing beat desync, or insufficient torque. The Marisposa is an example of a torque-limited ornithopter. The wings simply do not have the power to beat any faster and still keep up with their target positions without spazzing out. There are a few ways to improve on this, though. The most obvious is stacking more hinges to control each wing, and indeed this makes the biggest, single biggest difference. Past that, it can also help to move the center of mass of each wing toward the hinge and away from the wingtip by ballasting the wing toward the root. That is the purpose of the cannon barrels built into the wing roots of the Mariposa. Even further, it helps to have as little chaos in the system as possible. Joint flop is bad, and oscillations tend to quickly resonate and worsen if they develop. From a wing beat frequency perspective, and also from a shake perspective, the ideal wing would be balanced perfectly on the hinge axis and have as many hinges attached to it as possible. The easiest way to achieve this is to hinge the wing from the center of the aircraft such that both sides of the wing can share the same hinge axis, and then move them in a seesaw pattern. I've been experimenting with this on and off for a while, but I previously hadn't pursued it all that seriously because it eliminates the option to use dihedral on the wings to help clear the ground, which was necessary for the longer wings and higher wing beat amplitudes of my earlier designs. If you've got the torque and stability though, why not just use shorter wings with less amplitude and then beat them faster? Well, there lies the second limitation. Blade wing beat desync, a situation in which the blade angle falls out of phase with the wing beat and stops producing thrust, or begins to produce negative thrust. The Meadowhawk is an example of a desync limited ornithopter, 
It could run at higher frequencies, but if it were to beat its wings any faster, it would begin producing negative thrust. I'm not totally sure what causes this. I used to think it was entirely because of tick delay between the control surface reaching a given angle and its applying force from that angle. But, when pausing the game mid-wing stroke at high frequency, I was able to see the blades misaligning visually, too. Stormworks logic nodes do experience a one-tick delay across connections, but all my designs have placed the wing stroke control and control surface control signals the same node distance apart. That is to say, there is the same number of logic connections between the signal that generates the wing beat and the hinges, and the signal that generates the blade angle and the blades. One for the composite read, one for the output variable, and one between the output variable and the wing. In that manner, the control surfaces and wing roots should remain in sync, even if they're both three ticks behind the Lewis script. As it stands, my best guess is that there is an additional tick delay between the control surfaces receiving a signal and when they actually move towards it, and that this tick delay must be either higher or lower than a similar delay between a hinge receiving an input and a hinge acting on it. In any case, at higher frequencies, control surfaces will slide out of phase by 180 degrees or more. This presented a difficult barrier, and because of how suddenly the descent came on, I falsely assumed it wasn't predictable. I've been hungering for shorter-winged ornithopters for a long time, though, so on a lark I decided to try seeing if I could compensate for the desync. In retrospect, I have no idea why it took me so long to try that. It turns out the task is actually pretty much trivial. I simply offset the value that drives the control surfaces from the one that drives the wing roots. And that's done by a value proportional to the current frequency setting. The higher the frequency, the larger the offset. The offset value I chose was arbitrary. I just worked out what performed best through experimentation. And just like that, I found that I could beat the wings as fast as I wanted as long as I was able to keep them stable. And do so with the added benefit of being able to artificially desynchronize them to achieve things like reverse thrust and vertical thrust on a whim. So what's the big deal with high frequencies? Well, aside from the flashy stuff, like the potential for VTOL by playing with phasing, the biggest advantages are a substantial reduction in the minimum wing length and wing beat amplitude required to achieve flight. I have explained in the past that, in Stormworks, ornithopter thrust is a function of wing beat speed and wing length, with the wing length having a multiplicative effect on the speed, just like any object on the end of a long rotating arm. Because of the speed limitations I was facing, I turned to wing length to achieve the final velocities that I needed. The problem with this was threefold. It required ornithopters to be physically large, it made them difficult to ensure the wings would clear the ground, and, worst of all, it tended to look weird. Okay, looks aside, the ground clearance thing was a really big problem. Ornithopters have crazy high static thrust, so the higher you mount the wings, the more they try to nose over during takeoff. The Meadowhawk is a dramatic example of that. You can mitigate it somewhat by mounting the wings low and then tilting them up with the hedral, like the mariposa, but doing that introduces a lot of shake that seesaw configurations could otherwise eliminate, and it prevents the construction of perfectly balanced single-joint wings like the fireflies. A single, center-joint wing is essential for a zero-shake ornithopter, as the shake is primarily induced by little bits of cross-control between the sets of blades while they beat. Seesaw configurations eliminated the pitch cross-control oscillation, but traded it for, and usually much more mild, yaw oscillation. In both cases, the closer the wing sets are together, the lesser the shake would be, as the wings would more perfectly cancel each other out. Wings aligned perfectly on center, in theory, wouldn't shake at all, and it turns out they very nearly don't. Achieving higher frequencies allowed me to shorten my wings and reduce my amplitude, so I was able to actually build an ornithopter with this theoretical single-joint wing that wouldn't shake at all. Further, I could position that wing very close to the center of mass, thus facilitating easy, stable flight, the sort of flight that you would expect from a conventional aircraft. Now, let's take a closer look at the wing. First, the wing spar, here. This is just a bit of decorative XML, so we'll get it out of the way, as well as the hinge housing in part of the fuselage. From here, it's fairly clear how these wings are put together. Both sides of each wing are actually one piece attached to either side of a vertically oriented hinge. As I described earlier, this is how the Firefly achieves near zero shake, and it has the added benefit of reducing the number of physics bodies required for the wings by half.
It does mean that the hinges have to be mounted totally in line, though, so it is difficult to fit as many per wing. I find the trade is worth it, though, particularly on smaller designs requiring less power to fly. There also isn't much ground clearance here, but with the Firefly's tiny wing stroke amplitude, we don't have to care about that. You may notice these wings are not counterweighted at all. That is because, being one piece, their center of mass is already positioned exactly on the hinge point. There's nothing to counterweight. Also, the wings are translated down from the attachment point to align with the hinge vertically. That saves us a little shake by eliminating translation movement from the wing. Otherwise, these wings are very similar to my other designs. Starting narrow and ending wide, because blades towards the tip of the wing are more efficient than blades toward the root. That's pretty much it for the mechanics. Dead simple, and if you wanted to build something like this and weren't looking to get fancy, that could be the end of the story. We do have some strange control mixing going on in the code here, though, mostly for stability at high incidence bias. I'll go over it quickly in case you want to get into that kind of thing. Earlier, I mentioned adverse yaw. Adverse yaw happens in this aircraft at high incidence bias because the roll inputs basically twist the wing from whatever its current rotation is. If the wing is incidence biased to be mostly facing up, that means the thrust is twisting around the vertical axis rather than the forward axis, and thus generating yaw force rather than roll force. Fortunately, we do have a way of using the wings to produce force around the other axis, too. We could change the blade angle, the same control as the left lever, on the left and right side asymmetrically to produce more thrust on one side of the ornithopter than the other. In forward flight, at a low bias, this would result in a yaw force. In slow flight, at a high bias, it results in a roll force. So what we do is gradually switch the yaw and roll control factors by the bias factor. There's some arbitrary trimming beyond that. The yaw factor runs a little bit negative in forward flight to counteract asymmetric drag from roll inputs, but that's the gist of it. It sounds a little complicated, but it's really just arithmetic implemented in these couple of lines here. It was just a matter of test flying and determining what characteristics I could improve. When it comes to creating arbitrary forces, Beating wings are surprisingly flexible. If you take a minute to picture what's happening while they beat, you can work out a way to steer them to do all kinds of things and achieve incredible maneuverability while you're at it. So, our high-frequency ornithopters, which I use here to mean ornithopters beating fast enough to require phase-decent corrections, the end-all, be-all of ornithopter design. For the most part, yes. They are more flexible, easier to implement, comparable in efficiency, and smoother in almost every case. That said, there are a couple of differences to keep in mind when deciding whether to build a high or low frequency ornithopter. The first, weirdest, and most obvious is that high frequency ornithopters seem to be far more sensitive to weight than low frequency ornithopters. I have no idea why this is. If you've modified any of my earliest designs, you may have noticed that, in spite of limited climb performance, they are able to accept significant payloads with very little reduction in climb performance or speed in cruise flight. Conversely, if you've tried to make them lighter, you might have noticed that they don't really fly any better. The Firefly is not like that. I've become used to ignoring the impact of cosmetics while building in Stormworks, and was surprised by how heavily the fuselage I built for the Firefly impacted its performance. The final version is nearly six knots slower than the plane test bed I built it out from. I think it's likely that this has more to do with the wing length than wing frequency, and I'm only noticing it now because this is the first ornithopter I've gotten to fly at all with a wing length this short. In any case, it's something to consider, particularly when building on the small end. Past that, getting wings to beat quickly represents an engineering challenge and places some limitations on design. High-frequency ornithopters will need plentiful hinges, and their wings must be well-balanced. I don't think it's necessary to use a single-joint design like I'm using here, but it certainly helps. Otherwise, you'll probably have to do some creative counterweighting. As a related implementation problem, while I find that high-frequency wings are easier to implement mechanically, they are a little bit more challenging to implement in script. If you're looking for a low-code or no-code solution, then you might be better off pursuing a low-frequency ornithopter. The correction factor for high-frequency ornithopters is not really complicated, but it's easiest to understand if you're comfortable with trigonometry. Uh, the short version of what's happening is the wings are being driven by a sine or cosine function, and since the control surfaces fall out of sync at high speeds, they must be shifted to run slightly ahead or slightly behind of the wing beat along that sine or cosine function. It really is just arithmetic to implement, 
but it requires some experimentation, and like I said, if you're trying to avoid writing any code at all, uh, you will be making your life a little bit harder, building a high-frequency ornithopter. Finally, it's important to note that final ornithopter performance is a function of both wing frequency and wing length. I know I keep harping on this, but the interplay between these two will almost entirely determine how fast you can go. In theory, a longer wing will always be faster. The trouble is, the longer your wing, the harder it is to get it to beat quickly. Consider how much room you have for wing length and how much room you have for hinges. If you're very limited in hinge real estate, a slow, larger wing might be better than a fast, short one. And as a final note, I have to admit I have not yet tested high-frequency ornithopters in multiplayer servers. It seems likely to me that phase desync may be different in some circumstances when networked. Alright, that concludes the nerd section. I know I'm not the best at explaining this stuff clearly, but I hope it made some sense, and that it helps you design your own flappy things. If you stuck with me through all that, thanks. I am still planning to produce a tutorial, but the last one I tried came out to nearly three hours, and I've been pretty busy as of late and haven't been able to try again. For now, I'll see you later, hopefully with a single-joint VTOL ornithopter.